Hi, church family. Happy Sabbath, and welcome to the Palm Springs Seventh-day Adventist Church online. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us, and we pray that you had a great week, and we can't think of a better way to wrap up this week than worshiping together, even if it is online. We want to give you some announcements about things that are happening in our church. So to begin, we are going through a series titled A Life of Today we're talking about encouragement, and we have Pastor Mario Perez Sr. giving us the word, and we pray that it will be a blessing and that you might be encouraged because of it. We also want to let you know about our Be Well for Life series that is continuing to be available on YouTube um, or online on our website. You can find it. And that goes live um, every week on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. You can watch it, of course, anytime after that, but 5 p.m. on Tuesdays is when you can begin to look for it. We know that it's been uh, a blessing to us, and we hope that it's been a blessing to you as well. We want to let you know about uh, some things that are happening. So we have uh, our Women's Ministries uh, online meeting happening this Sunday at 10 a.m. We hope that if you are a lady, you'd like to join, that you will do so. On our newsletter, there is a um, RSVP link um, that you can select if you want to get information about how to join. Also, we have Sabbath school happening every single week in addition to this worship service. Um, We hope that you will continue to join us online for that. And we have, you know, youth Sabbath school available on Zoom as well as children's Sabbath school available on Zoom. So we're trying to stay connected and continue studying together. This quarter we are studying through the book of Isaiah. I have loved this uh, lesson and I hope that you have as well. Isaiah is a great, great book to study, and uh, we hope that you'll continue to join us for that. Also, we want to keep you in prayer. If you have any prayer requests that you'd like to share with us, please do so. You can email us. You can call the church office. Um, We want to pray for you. We want to keep you lifted up, and we want to stay connected in this way, even while we are physically apart. We also want to remember um, a family that's very dear to us, especially this week, um, Past, I mean, uh, Ed Aronson has passed away, and we just want to keep Doreen and their family in our prayers, um, pray for comfort and for uh, peace during this time of grieving. And, uh, you know, our hearts just really go out to this family. Um, Ed was such a dear part of this church family, and I know that we're all uh, touched and impacted by his, his passing. So we wanted to make you aware of that, and please ask you to continue to pray. Also, if you um, would like to drop off your uh, tithes and offerings or really anything that you might need to drop off here at the church uh, in letter form, you can do so. There's a mail slot in our office door, so you can do so there. Um, Or if you'd like to mail something into our church, um, i.e. your uh, tithes and your offerings, then you can do so at our post office box, which is 4339 Palm Springs, California, 9226. Three. So the the zip code is a little bit different from our church address. It's 92263 instead of 64. So just make note of that. Um, you can mail things to our church using our post office box. Also, we want to let you know that... Um, your tithe receipts are going to be mailed next week. Um, We got word from the conference that they were mailed out this week, which means it takes time to turn it around and to send it out to you. So you can expect to find those probably next week. And finally, we just want to let you know that during this time, while we are physically apart, we are still a church family. Church is not a place that we go to. It's a family that we belong to, and we are still family here at the Palm Springs Seventh-day Adventist Church. We hope that we get to see you soon. We hope that you are doing well and know that you are prayed for and loved. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Now is the time when we do the offering appeal. If you've probably guessed by now, there are three ways to give. You can give through the U.S. mail to our new P.O. box. You can use your bank's online bill pay service to pay your tithes and offerings. Or you can use AdventistGiving.org. This week's offering is for local church budget. Now, I'll tell you a little story um, that kind of illustrates the importance of local church budget. And we know about the lights, we know about the insurance and the taxes that we have to pay 
on our church property. And we know that uh, we support ourselves here through local church budget. But this is a little story I'd like to tell about a new pastor. He arrived early in the week for a tour of his new church and the new school. The deacon showed him around the sanctuary, but the pastor gasped when he saw, and he asked, what happened here? There are large streaks of watermarks running down the walls on both sides of the sanctuary. Well, long story short, it's a budget issue, said the deacon. Well, after the tour, the pastor thanked the deacon and he decided to go home. As he prayed about the situation, the Lord pressed upon that pastor's heart that he must find some way to restore God's house of worship. On his first Sabbath, his first sermon, after the conference president introduced him, the pastor stood up and he looked at the walls of the church. He looked over to the left, he looked over to the right, and he scanned those walls. He said, beginning next week, we shall work together as a church. We will shall restore God's holy temple, he said. The church, it erupted with praise. And the very next Sabbath, the pastor placed an offering in the plate. And he asked the congregation to join him and to give to the church budget project. Six weeks later, six weeks, they completed the repairs and the church renewed God's house of worship. Now, during the pandemic, we've had this opportunity and our church members have absolutely stepped up and help us, helped us out with many projects that needed to be done. Thank you, church, for always contributing. And thank you this week for contributing to local church budget. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for all of your wonderful and gracious servants, all of them here in Palm Springs. Thank you for all of the offerings. Thank you for all of uh, the wonderful blessings that you give to us each and every week. Although we don't get to see each other all the time and we don't get to fellowship and we don't get to, to enrich our souls the way we would like to, we know that with you, Lord, we can absolutely accomplish anything. Please, Lord, always watch over your church. Always watch over this congregation and help us, Lord, to spread the word here in the Palm Springs area. Please bless, bless all of those who have contributed and bless those also who are in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, church. We want to, again, just thank you so much for worshiping with us. Uh, you know, this morning I have, uh, boy, the opportunity to uh, lead out in prayer. And, uh, you know, before we get into prayer, you know, this has been, uh, been, a, it's been a sad week. You know, this week many of you know that uh, um, our, our beloved Ed Aronson passed away. And, uh, you know, this has been uh, just a difficult time for the family. And, you know, the Aronson family is a family that we love very much. And we want to let them know that they, uh, we are praying for you. And, uh, you know, we found a promise that's found in John. In John 14, Jesus says some words that have really hit my heart in terms of encouragement. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my dad's house, in my father's house, are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back. I'm coming back and I'm going to come and bring you home. Um, you know, we have a God that is going to make things right. We have a God that is, uh, is going to put an end to the, uh, the hurt and pain that we are suffering in this world. And, uh, that's a promise that, uh, you know, in moments like these, we, uh, I tell you, we find so comforting. And, uh, you know, as we get into our prayer, you know, we are a community that believes in the power of prayer. We are a community that believes that prayer is something that is so incredibly important uh, for our hearts because we get to commune with a God who is faithful. And so, you know, this morning we uh, are going to pray. and We, we have a, a, a newsletter that is sent out every week that has all of our prayer requests. We want to invite you to continue to pray through those names um, with us. Because again, we, you know, we're family and we have an opportunity to lift each other up in prayer. Hey, so uh, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me um, for, our, uh, for our time of prayer. 
God, we thank you so much, Father, for this, uh, Lord, opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for being a God who is faithful. We thank you for being a God who is true. And we thank you for being a God who's going to make things right. Lord, you tell us to not let our hearts be troubled because we believe in God and we also believe in you. Father, we know that uh, the day is coming soon when you will come back. And Father, what a glorious day that will be. But until then, Father, we continue to keep our eyes fixated, or keep our eyes focused on your Son and on his work on our behalf. Father, what your Son has completed and done makes these moments less hurtful and painful because we know that your Son will make things right. And Lord, this morning, we just want to, Lord, lift up those that are hurting, we lift up those that are going through, uh, through difficulties, whether it's be financial, relational, uh, spiritual, health issues, Father. We, we put all of those requests, those spoken, those written, and those that we have right now in our, in our living rooms, on our hearts, we put them at your feet. And Lord, we do that confidently knowing that you will, um, your will will be done. Thank you, Father, for being um, a God who is active and present in our everyday life. And Father, this morning again, we, we come together and we, uh, Lord, we seek your will. And we ask you, Father, in this moment to Lord, have first place in our heart and our life. We thank you for being a God who, uh, who not only is uh, our, our Father, our Abba, but a, a God who will provide. And for that, we are so incredibly thankful. Father, we love you. We thank you in all of these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. In church, again, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Um, you know, I, I, I get an opportunity to, ask, to really to uh, introduce our speaker for this, uh, this morning. Our speaker, uh, his name is Mario Perez. Um, he, uh, he right now is the, um, the senior pastor at Laguna Niguel. Uh, even though he is retired, I'll tell you, he is still serving the Lord. Uh, he, this is dad for me, uh, very quickly, uh, he retired two years ago and yet he is still working. And, uh, as, uh, as someone who, uh, I'll tell you, loves Jesus, I, I, I th th that's what I want, you know, being almost 90 years old, he's not 90, uh, but being, uh, that time in life and still passionate, so passionate about serving the Lord. So, hey, I'll tell you, I am, I am so, uh, so happy to welcome him. Uh, he is going to be preaching today. We are starting a new series called A Life of Blank. And today he is talking about encouragement. I'll tell you, I have seen that encouragement throughout my life. So I am so excited that, uh, he is here today. So, uh, uh, wanna, wanna welcome, um, Pastor Mario Perez. Thank you, uh, son, Pastor Mario, for that uh, introduction. And it's uh, good to be here. Um, you're going to be having a series, starting a series in this church. I have the first part. And so I want to thank uh, the pastor for inviting me and being able to share God's word with you this morning. Imagine, imagine being so well known for comforting and encouraging the people around you. Uh, people stop referring to you by your name choosing instead to call you by your nickname. Suppose that nickname becomes so common that some people who hear about you don't even know your real name. That's exactly what happened to Joseph, an influential leader in the early church. Luke, the author of Acts, introduces us to this Levite from Cyprus at the end of the fourth chapter of Acts, explaining that Joseph was also known as Barnabas. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 through 37. Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of an encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Depending on the Bible translation you read, Barnabas is defined as son of encouragement, son of consolation, or son of exhortation. <clears throat> Luke never again refers to this individual as Joseph, but calls him Barnabas 23 more times. The Apostle Paul refers to Barnabas five times in his epistle, but never once by his real name, 
Joseph. Barnabas did not earn this name with a few pats in the back. What he did was far more significant, as suggested by the Greek word translated <clears throat> encouragement. Definition. Encourage means to comfort, console, and strengthen. Literally, to put in courage or <clears throat> to inspire another with courage. The word encourage, akin or like comforter, one of the names of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. You know, people often connect the moving of the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, only with signs, with wonders, and miracles. However, when we truly encourage one another, we show God's Holy Spirit is working in us and through us to comfort and encourage others. So let us spend a few minutes looking at the life of Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and the role he played in encouraging others. I dare say that many of us here are going through distressing times, in the time we're living in, facing health problems and physical disabilities. Some are facing problems concerning children or other family members. Others have lost a loved one in this recent past, a friend. Some may be having a difficult time at work, and some may be having a difficult time finding work. Maybe some, someone has wronged you, or maybe someone thinks you have wronged them. When our life is constantly bombarded with difficulty, it is common to suffer discouragement and depression. <clears throat> we are not alone. Some great and famous people have suffered from great bouts of discouragement and depression. A story was told of a boy at the age of seven, he had to go to work to help support his family. At age nine, at age nine, his mother died. At 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. At 23, he went into debt and became a partner in a small store. At 26, his partner died, leaving him a huge debt. And by age 35, by the age of 35, he had been defeated twice while running for a seat in Congress. And at one point in his life, he wrote in his journal that he struggled with a great depression and could not see any reason for going on with his life. But he did, did keep going on. His faith was strong. At the age of 37, he won the election for congression, a congressional seat. At 39, he lost his bid for re-election. At 41, his four-year-old son died. <clears throat> At 42, he was rejected for a position as a land officer. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he ran for the Senate again and lost again. At the age of 51, he was elected President of the United States. During his presidency, there was a great civil war and his country broke apart. During his second term in off of office, he was assassinated. But his name lives on as one of the greatest people in United States history. I'm sure you figured out by now that I've been talking about who? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln did not allow discouragement to keep him down. There is hope for us during these tough times. If we want to be more like Barnabas, we will also be faced with choices about how we view our brothers and sisters. In essence, Barnabas was known not just for offering a few words of encouragement or comfort, but for standing beside people in their trials. He was not emotionally detached from them, but joined them in their troubles. 
It is altogether fitting that we first hear of this man selling a parcel of land so the money could be distributed among people in need. As we have already noted in verses 36 and 37, now several incidents in the book of Acts demonstrate Barnabas as an advocate defending someone who was not trusted or who had fallen out of favor, out of grace. Standing up for John Mark, surprisingly, the characteristic of Barnabas actually resulted in his separation from Paul. At the beginning of what we now know as Paul's second missionary journey through Asia Minor, Barnabas wanted to take John called Mark, but Paul was against the idea of asking someone who had left them during their first journey. Let us read about it in Acts 15, 36, 41. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul, Paul did not want the young man along on his second journey. Barnabas did. His support for John Mark was so passionate that Barnabas refused to give in to Paul, who also refused to yield to Barnabas. Their contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, as we have read in verse 39. As it turns out, Barnabas recognized the potential of this young man when those around him saw only danger, problems, and past failings, John Mark went to author the Gospel of Mark. Not only that, but John Mark eventually proved himself worthy to Paul, who mentions him as a companion and co-worker three times in his letters in 2 Timothy, and we're going to look at two, in 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philemon 124. First, let us look at the passage in Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is what? He is helpful to me in my ministry. And then in Philemon 124, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. What does he say? My fellow workers. What about us? Do we, like Barnabas, look for the potential in others and not their failures? Earlier, Paul himself had been the beneficiary of such a support from Barnabas. The early church did not trust Paul, also known as Saul, who had vigorously persecuted early Christians. The first incident mentioned was the stoning of Stephen. When this occurred, the witnesses, it says, laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is in Acts 7, 58. The very next chapter tells us that Saul made havoc of the church, Acts 8, 3, which scattered throughout that region. In his zeal, Saul volunteered to travel to Damascus to arrest. And Acts 9.2 says that if he found any that were of the way, any of the, of the way, either men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And to bring them back to Jerusalem for what? For trial. And while 
It was on this journey that Saul encounters Jesus, who he was persecuting. Jesus says, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus. It's no wonder then that when Saul returned to Jerusalem, the disciples there were afraid of him. Acts 9.26, they did not trust him. Then Barnabas steps in, the son of encouragement, in Acts 9.27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus, taking Saul before the apostles and presenting evidence of his conversion. Barnabas acted as what? As an advocate. He stood by Paul when no one else believed or trusted him. He saw the potential in Saul. Barnabas acted on Paul's behalf another time, uh, twice, a second time in Antioch. Acts 11.21 tells us that the hand of the Lord was with them so that a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard that a great number of Gentiles in Antioch had turned to the Lord, Acts 11.21, the church sent for Barnabas, son of encouragement, there to teach. After his initial visit, Barnabas traveled to Tarsus, searching for Saul and recruiting him to assist in this work. Together they returned to Antioch, where they spent an entire year teaching. Let's read about, let's read this account found in Acts 11, verses 25, 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What made Barnabas such a powerful witness in Antioch? Luke goes on to give us a description of Barnabas's character. In Acts 11, 24, reads, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. It is because of his, of his character that his words are accepted by these young believers of the Church of Antioch. His character of goodness, of integrity, of and uprightness marked him, marked him out as the right man for this task. You know, Luke describes no one else in the book of Acts as a good man. Luke further tells us that Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. It is this that is the source of his character, the source of the goodness in his life, and the source that changed people's lives, bringing a great number of people to the Lord. Gary Smalley, an American family counselor and author of books on family relations from a Christian perspective, in his book, The Blessing, tells us of how one teacher, one teacher gave him the encouragement he needed to change his life. When he was in grade school, he could not get math, and it was still a problem for him in college. He had to repeat geometry in his senior year, and it looked like he was going to fail again. The teacher reinforced the sense of failure by putting the failing students along the back wall. One Monday, he dragged himself into class, into the classroom to be seated with the other failures in the back row. Then his life was suddenly changed, for there was a substitute teacher. The regular teacher had been assigned to a different district. 
It is hard to believe that a teacher can make such a, such a difference. But listen to the testimony of Smalley in his own words, and you will feel the power of a Barnabas, son of encouragement, in action. Something that that teacher said that morning literally changed my life. In fact, it motivated me so much that I ended up minoring in mathematics in college. While I didn't realize it at the time, he actually blessed me and other students in the class. He did this by providing us with a clear picture of an active commitment. Standing before the class that morning, our new teacher told us, if anyone fails this class, then I have failed. He made a commitment that morning to do whatever it took to see that we all passed the course. He pledged himself to see that we learn and enjoy the subject to the best of our abilities. Whether that meant his staying after school to tutor, tutor us, or even coming in for a special session on the weekend, he dedicated himself to seeing that each of us made it through the course. Smalley goes on to say that the whole attitude of the class was changed. And at the end of the year, everyone passed. He even received his first A in math. We have no idea how many lives this teacher encouraged. He was one of those behind the scenes people who never got his name up in lights, but he encouraged others to go on and do their best so that they became famous or helpful to many people. We tend to scold and criticize the weaknesses of children, but the approach of encouragement motivates children to go beyond their weaknesses and be overcomers. Another important characteristic of Barnabas was that he was willing to take risks in order to encourage people in the faith. You and I must do the same. We will get it wrong sometimes, yes, but it is worth the risk for a John Mark who has messed up to be given another chance, another opportunity. It is worth the risk for a Paul who has messed up to become a great evangelist and church planter. It is worth the risk to encourage the grace of God working in others. Christians, you know, owe a lot to Barnabas. We owe Paul to him who went on to write 14 epistles. We also owe Mark to him who wrote the gospel according to Mark. In a sense, we, almost, we owe almost half of the New Testament to Barnabas even if he did not write a single word. I wonder what would have happened without Barnabas' encouragement of Paul in bringing him to the apostles in Jerusalem and recognizing the call of God for him to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Where would John Mark have ended up if Barnabas had not taken him on that missionary journey and given him another chance, another opportunity. Barnabas' ministry of encouragement had eternal significance for the gospel, and so can ours. The importance of encouraging others is beautifully illustrated in Charles, I'm sorry, in James and Ellen White's four-day journey to Wacon, Iowa, in search of John Lawferrell in the Shield of Winter, John was a young minister back then who became discouraged in the ministry. In those days, the work was just beginning to be organized. So John Lawferrell became discouraged and went into the lock business, making locks. That didn't go well for him. So he moved to walk on Iowa to farm. The whites traveled four days in the dead of winter to look for John. They crossed the Mississippi River when it was partly frozen, 
Some didn't want to cross, but they did. When they arrived at Walk-On to John's house, he was on top of a ladder fixing something in the roof. Sister White's first words to him were, What doest thou here, Elijah? He couldn't very well tell her things got so tough. Here this poor lady had traveled for four days in dangerous winter conditions. A few days, though, a few days there with John and in her encouraging him, that's all it took. John Loughborough became one of the greatest institution and conference presidents, editor of the Science of the Time, director of the Pacific Press, all because of her encouraging words. We too can be a Barnabas and live a life of encouragement. Let's examine practical and simple ways we can put into action to encourage others in their physical, mental, and emotional health. Learn from Barnabas and Paul. One, speaking. Our spoken words can bring healing and encouragement. Live someone, live someone by telling how you appreciate them or how well they are doing when appropriate, of course. Share a scripture that help you in a hard time with them. You know, Barnabas was an advocate. He spoke, not only spoke words of encouragement, but also recognized the potential in others. Two, writing. Write an encouraging note to someone or send a postcard or a message on social media. A short note saying, I care or I'm praying will mean much to someone who is lonely, grieving, or discouraged with health and life issues. Write a scripture, a story, or a poem to lift them up. Paul wrote encouraging letters, even when he was chained in a prison cell. Three, helping. Helpers use ordinary skills to encourage others. This can be anything from helping someone move, babysitting for a young couple, cleansing their home, cleaning their home, or helping them fix or construct something. Barnabas used his skills to help members of the early church in Antioch. For giving, givers recognize situations where money, food, clothing, or the loan of equipment will better lift, out, lift people out of their situation. Barnabas gave the proceeds of his property to care for the needs of the poor. Five, presence. Even when we don't know what to say, just being there encourages. Barnabas' presence spoke volumes in Antioch. Touching. Scientists have now documented the positive effects of touch. Simply putting a hand on a shoulder or a tight hug can communicate that you care. Barnabas touched people's life with encouragement. Seven, hospitality, another practical way, can still be done with precautions during a pandemic. Hospitality means to take care of others. Sometimes simply uh, loving people by providing a meal or bed or assisting them during a physical problem. This encouragement can help people who are hurting from health issues, marriage breakups, or financial problems. Barnabas shared what he had with others. Eight, praying. Prayers always encourage others. And research on the healing benefits of prayer are enormous. Barnabas was a man of prayer, filled with the Holy Spirit and a man of faith. Find which type of encouragement best fits you. Then simply practice it. You'll be lifted up as you lift others up. May God help us live a life of encouragement. God bless you. Let us have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Barnabas, the son of encouragement whose real name was Joseph. But because 
He was such a comforter, an encouraging person. They called him by his nickname, Barnabas. We pray, God, that we could be encouragers as well, especially during these difficult times. Help us, O Lord, through the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit like Barnabas and faith, and that we can do a work, a ministry for you. Bless the church here in Palm Springs. Bless each leader, each member, for we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.